Hi, I'm Megan. Welcome to today's live reading of An Ember of Hope by Teresa Von Spankerin, presented by Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. Join me. Chapter one. I watched as the flames ignited the sparse grass on the mountainside. After a moment, one of the dead pines also caught fire and spread to more trees. Most people would be afraid of the growing fire, but I smiled in delight. In fact, it was burning a little too slowly for me. I looked down at my hand, concentrating on the embers nearby. Slowly, a small ball of orange flame appeared on my palm. It felt as if it had been ages since I was able to achieve this. In reality, it had probably been only a year, maybe a little more, but it seemed so much longer. Not since before. I grimaced, and the ball of heat and light in my hand pulsed. Not since before Valentino imprisoned me, before she died. Christy. Angrily, I flung the ball at the nearest unburned tree. I hadn't wanted to come back up to these mountains. For the better part of a year, I had stayed in this area trying to heal, trying to forget. I thought I had succeeded a couple of months ago and returned to Florence. But shortly after I had arrived back in the city, I had sensed the other still in the catet, Julia in particular, and realized the traitor was still living with them. Candlelit lanterns hanging in a few from a few of the poles on the streets had exploded, showering nearby structures with embers. It took every bit of strength I had recovered to smother the fire that had threatened to consume that part of the city. The knowledge that she was still there had caused my power to go wildly out of control. It wasn't safe for me to be in the city yet with her around. Julia had attacked us. She had seemed more than happy to return me to the people who had tortured and who had ne nearly killed me. I had thought she was my friend. I had thought of her like a sister, and she had been more than willing to hurt me and her, hurt the others. And they had just accepted her back, claiming she had some bout of madness. The worst was that not only was she still living with them, she was still connected to me telepathically. I screamed in rage and pain, and the crackling of wood burning answered me. When I opened my eyes, half of the forest in front of me was engulfed, and flames were streaking down the side of the mountain in the opposite direct and direction. <clears throat> I followed, monitoring, monitor, monitoring its progress for a while before shrinking the wall of fire until only a few small flames were left. Without much wind to drive it past a river up ahead, I believed it would just burn out. Exhausted, I turned to hike back to my tiny cabin. My attempt to hold my breath failed at the sharp sting of the icy water my head was forced into. Involuntarily, I gasped and inhaled the fluid into my lungs. I struggled against the men holding me, but I couldn't get enough leverage to dislodge them. I couldn't breathe. My lungs burned for air. I couldn't breathe. I awoke gasping for air with sunlight streaming through the windows. My cabin only had had only a single room with minimal protection from the sun. I drew in deep breaths of air as the panic faded a bit. Carefully, I got dressed again. There would be no more sleep for me, not if I wanted to try to sleep tomorrow morning. With a sigh, I put a hat on to shield my eyes and trudged out of the cabin. I hated being up so close to midday, but the last year or so had taught me that once the nightmare started, it was a, it was hopeless to try and sleep anymore that day. The best I could hope for was when I could go back to sleep near dawn. I frowned as I felt a light breeze. The fire I had started should be out, but was it possible this gentle wind could have stirred up embers that I missed? It was my responsibility to ensure the fires I started didn't jeopardize the few villages in the area. I didn't want to hurt anyone. And they were also my only source of blood when I stayed in the area. So I followed the trail of burned and smoldering timber and grass down to a large river that I had pushed it toward. A few of the flames or embers had jumped to the natural barrier, and I spent some time recapturing the glowing pieces before they could spread somewhere unwanted. Damn the nightmares. I thought they had finally passed, but I was wrong. Shaking my head, I put the coals into a smoldering branch and carried the branch with them safely inside as I hiked the rest of the day and into the night. Depending on why, what nightmare I had, it seemed to cripple my ability to use my element and stay warm. 
I was lucky this nightmare hadn't affected my ability to work with already burning brush. I paused on another peak and set another fire from the saved embers. I relished the heat as the area burned. My thoughts returned to my earlier musings. Julia still lived with the rest of the quartet down in the city. Even as far away as I was, I could sense her if I tried hard enough. The others seemed healthy enough. It seemed she hasn't attacked anyone since we left England. Why? Was it possible that Samuel and the others were right? Was that why I was still connected somehow, even though I didn't want to be? How could Samuel let her stay with them? The wave of anger and betrayal I felt this time nearly drove me to my knees. The memory of Julia appearing in that clearing after she had lured us there, the casual way that Valentino had greeted Marianne that night, how I had wished that I could have burned both of them that second. But I had been too weakened to tap into my element. I had barely been able to make a candle flicker, let alone create fire in the middle of the woods. Even now, I still needed an already burning source to manipulate to use to my element. I had been on the verge of death when my soulmate died. I hadn't been able to protect her. Christy had never betrayed anyone. She had died trying to save me. Glancing in the direction of where Florence lay, I wonder how Julia seemed to get more protection than she did. I debated a moment. The winds up here were gentle tonight, easier to overcome. Even if they were blowing opposite of Florence, it would probably take all of my energy to shift the direction of the flames, but I could do it. As long as the wind didn't pick up, I could put everything I had into pushing the growing fire the opposite direction, down the mountain and straight for the city. Once down in the valley, the winds tended to blow in Florence's direction. I wouldn't have to use any power once it got that far. I could let it consume everything, my cabin, the villages between here and there, the city itself. Already, I felt the fire stalling, straining against the wind that naturally helped it. It was responding to the intent in my mind, the desire to let it destroy everything, my fellow cadet members along, among the thousands that would perish. Almost immediately, I felt the bonds with them pulse faintly as I thought of the survivors. We weren't any closer physically, but the memory of Jeffrey and me brawling after some stupid joke flooded my head. Playing games and the occasional pranks had been some of our favorite pastimes, and another unwanted memory arose unbidden. There was, the time, there was that time when we decided to scare the others. Christ, that had to be a decade or better before the new members had joined the group. I had carefully burned a sleeve of one, of one of Jeffrey's shirts, and when we were out hunting, he had changed into it. I still didn't know how he faked the pain, but we had fooled Christy, Marianne, and Robert with that stunt. Samuel had been out with Sharon at the time, so there was no way to know if we would have fooled them too. Mary Ann's scolding as well as Jeffrey's retort were burned into my memory. We thought he was badly burned. That's not funny, Matthew. Do you realize how dangerous that could have been? You and Jeffrey should be ashamed of yourselves. Pray calm yourself, Mary Ann. We weren't that reckless to have Matthew burn it while I was wearing it. You have to admit, we fooled you. It was hilarious. Was the bond reacting to my thoughts? I didn't want to remember anything good or nice or you let her use you against us. She was able to hurt us with it and Julia is still connected. But when Robert threatened her and Valerie, his bond with us had dissolved within a couple of days. Julia had literally attacked us and you let her remain connected to us. Why? If I had expected a verbal answer from the strange telepathic power that linked us, I was disappointed. All I heard was the cackle of wood and a faint echo of my own voice. Who or what would be answering me all the way up here? The fact that I thought I would get an answer. Maybe I've been up here alone for a little too long. To ensure my own safety from the fire, I pushed it slightly away back in the original direction. I felt another shift in power, but this was different. It was my link with Samuel, and I worried that he had sensed my thoughts. We've never tested how far exactly we could communicate with the, with the sire fledgling bond, but I could sense him more clearly than the others. For a second, I wondered if he was attempting to talk to me, but I only sensed concern. He must have felt my emotions, but not my thoughts. The knowledge didn't stop my mind from skipping around randomly before locking onto another memory. This one even less appreciated than the one before. 
It had been shortly after Samuel had turned to Julia. I waited until the door closed behind Christy as they left. It was the first time since she had been turned that Julia had left the house without Samuel. I had started to wonder if the new member of our group would warm up to any of the rest of us. Had killing that bastard of a husband she had been married to made that much of a difference already? I turned to Samuel, who was still standing at the closed door. Christy and Marianne will take care of her, I said. I know, he replied and tore his gaze from the door. He sat down at the table and I joined him. Jeffrey and the other two had just slept a couple of hours before, not having waited to see if they could persuade Julia to go out with them. Samuel, I was hoping to get some alone time to talk. I have some concerns. Pray tell, what's on your mind? Your new fledgling. This is the first night in almost a month she hasn't been at your side. I can sense her through the cadet, Samuel, yet she seems completely oblivious to the power that connects us. The only one she seems to connect to at all is you. And that might simply be because you're her creator. She senses it, Matthew, just not consciously. She won't allow herself to feel more than what's necessary to communicate with various people. Still, I heard from Christy that you finally laid eyes on our last member, the one who is still human, the one that is Julia's soulmate, although it sounded like she didn't sense that either. That's not normal, Samuel. I know you've never had a soulmate, but I sensed Christy from streets away when we first met, and as soon as she spotted me, she felt the connection as well. A small smile touched his lips. That being said, she didn't leave with you that first night, did she? Or the night after that? No, we saw each other for at least a week before those other vampires attacked her, but you knew that already. She didn't know I was a vampire. She only knew she was attracted to me, that she found it easy to confide things in me. But Julia said she's never going to love anyone again. She went looking for the boy only a week after being turned. Does that sound like someone who's disconnected from their soulmate? And the young man in question seems to sense she's still alive. When Julia decided to follow him out of that pub, he also appeared to perceive us following him. Their bond might be troubled, but it is still there. I shook my head. It's not normal, I repeated. When Christy was attacked, I felt her fear, her pain. There was no hesitation when I rushed to her aid. As for Julia, I would have thought she would have connected to one of the women by now as well. I doubt she will be inclined to become very friendly with me. She recognized me from that night. I stopped her while out with her sister. She wanted to know why I sent her back. Why I didn't at least take her baby, I said and glanced down. It had only been a week or two prior that Julia had questioned me about why I had looked familiar to her. That is unfortunate. Since it had been so late, I hadn't thought she would have recognized you from that night. I haven't noticed her being too hostile to you. No, but she's been much quieter around me. Samuel sighed, concern and worry darkening his eyes. I should have had you take her and the baby that night. I shouldn't have tried to wait any longer. Doing so cost Julia her daughter's life and very nearly her own. What would we have fed her? We hadn't had enough food for her or the baby yet. We had just enough oats for a week's supply of gruel and Damien was supposed to drop off some cured meat a few days after she had already been turned. The first vegetables of the garden he himself ate only a week ago. If Damien gave us too much food, that would have raised suspicion, and if we had tried to go to the market to purchase so much food, it would have also raised suspicion, considering the cast of people we've posed as. Samuel shook his head but said nothing. I knew he didn't have a good answer and dropped it. Instead, I said, I thought by now she would have had, would have befriended someone other than you. It's truly like the rest of us aren't connected to her. He glanced at the door before looking back at me. I watched as several expressions crossed his face, anger, fear, protectiveness. At first, I thought he was angry at me, but his voice was sad when he spoke again. Haven't you figured it out yet, Matthew? Her face and body have healed, but that's superficial. Julia still fears one of you is going to hit her. As for your question about befriending one of the woman, women, the women she had known in her human life, 
had been unable or unwilling to help her. She doesn't realize that Mary Ann or the others can protect her any better than those women can. I ran a hand through my hair, remembering how pale Julia was when she arrived here, how it made every bruise and cut glaringly obvious. Her face had been covered in purple, blue, and yellow. The, one of the fingers on one of her hands had been twisted and bent, broken in possibly more than one place. Samuel, do you think she's worried that we're going to give her back that give her back to that brutish murdering fiend? I, Matthew, I believe that is exactly what she thought until the night we killed him. Samuel's voice held a certain gleeful satisfaction that it rarely had when we when he killed. I felt my lips turn up in a fierce smile at that memory. Samuel and I had toyed with that man for a while before we killed him. We had everyone else in the cadet on lookout and hypnotism duty to ensure that we had been left alone with the bastard for as long as we wished. I shook my head as I realized Samuel was still talking. Even if she isn't feeling the cadet's power yet, she obviously is feeling safer since then. She's agreed to go to town with Christy and Mary Ann without me. It may take a little longer for her to warm up to you and the other men. You love her, I said. Samuel stared at me. That's ridiculous. No, it's not. I've seen the way you look at her, how careful you are with her. Christy and I can calm the other down by merely being near each other. I haven't seen you look like a, look at a woman like that since before Valerie found her fated love. Julia already has a soulmate. We've discussed this. I... One she hasn't even acknowledged she loves. You should tell her how you feel before she realizes it. He frowned at me. Even if I did love her, I cannot tell her that. Right now, I think anyone saying that to her would do more harm than good. And your soulmate has already told me to stay out of it. Christy talked to you about this? Samuel crossed his arms and nodded. What will it hurt to tell her? By the way, Julia acts, I think she fancies you as well. Would you have liked me trying to court your soulmate, Matthew? Of course not, I snapped. However, the bond Julia has with this young man is not as strong as it should be. It might disappear. I have never heard of such a sacred bond disappearing. As Julia heals more, it may mend itself. She seemed happy when she saw him, Matthew. How can I get in the way of that? I sighed. I knew Samuel was trying to do the noble thing here, but I wondered how he would react once the young man was actually living here with us. He may not want to admit it, but he had already fallen for the girl, and I suspected that, in a way, despite the connection she had with the human, she was doing the same thing with him. Think about it, Samuel. Once they connect more, you'll never find out if she feels the same.